Welcome back to Nuts and Bolts Tort. The first part of this episode is going to be going over the stuff that's changed with Astral Sorcery, which I think should bring us up to date with everything that's happened from in between the long break. And then after that, I'm going to be doing some R&D on RF Tools Control, which is like a graphical programming kind of thing. I have extremely little experience with it, but I want to get into it a bit and see how it works and use it as uh, a way of controlling another type of energy generation that I think I want to use because I have been relying upon my uh, canola oil farm for quite a while and I love that thing it's I love how I set it up and it's a really cool system and I'm gonna leave it running of course it makes a decent amount of power at around 4000 RF per tick but I need more power I quite often run out of power especially if I run something with really high needs like the arc furnace Sometimes, depending on what's using power at the time, the arc furnace will just completely <laughs> like die and get very, very slow because other things happen to be using power at the same time. So I need to work on power stuff. Anyway, to begin with, let's go into Astral Sorcery. So this may look a little bit different, but look up. That looks even more different. So when I went back to the Astral Sorcery place, you might remember we had that. This hasn't changed. Like, the, the basic platform hasn't changed here, where that's where I make the uninspected mineral using Astral Sorcery. But there was a platform here that used to have the, the uh, I forgot exactly what it was called, Celestial Altar, or whatever the right tier of the crafting table was. It used to be here, and then if you remember right, it ended up not having enough starlight, so I had to move it up. Well, that looked ugly, kind of being up on stilts, and it had like a ladder, or not a ladder, but uh, steps leading down here. And I just thought, okay, if stuff needs to be high up, you know, Astral Sorcery is a magic mod, stuff needs to be high up, I get everywhere with a backpack. I'm just thinking, let's just forget our connection to the ground. And I just made everything floating platforms. So I got rid of that platform there and just left this up at the top. It used to be on stilts here, now it's not. It's just here, up in the air. Ah, oh, I was right, the Celestial Altar. So that's what happened with that. The other problem I was running into, and actually the entire reason that I did all of this stuff, all those four things up there, are because the unexpected minerals stopped being produced. So remember before, I was relying on the crystal down here. This collector crystal. I was relying on this collector crystal and it was connecting to some, um, some mirrors or lenses or whatever they were called that went from here and then they went all the way over here and finally connected to the gravel here. Basically what this crystal is doing. And it worked fine, it worked really well for a while. And then at one point, I think this is when I was before the big break, at some point it just stopped working and I don't know why. It's like it, it, it didn't have the range to hit the gravel anymore. So I moved the last lens a little bit closer to the gravel and then it started working again. I thought, okay, that's odd. And then a bit later, it stopped working again. So it's almost as if the naturally occurring collector crystal over there perhaps gets weaker with time. I don't know. Either way, I figured it doesn't seem to be working out too well. So I need to look at what I need to do to make my own collector crystal. Because it turns out you can. This celestial collector crystal. I looked it up in the book and you can make it. But it takes quite a lot of steps, which is why I had to make all of this. So step one before doing a bunch of other stuff. You know the aquamarine? These things? The aquamarines are used for a lot of things and they're fairly hard to find. So I ended up setting up an aquamarine generator. Let me just grab something real quick. All right, so this is the aquamarine generator. I just searched online for how to generate aquamarine and I found this, I think it was an album on Imager that showed a setup for how to do this. And it's strange. I don't know if it's, I don't think it's really documented in the book at all that you can do this. But um, basically if you have liquid starlight and lava and you have them come together, meet in the middle, they generate, most of the time, the vast, vast majority of the time, they just generate sand. Which is why you see sand everywhere. But very, very rarely, they will generate aquamarine shale. 
Yeah, I just wanted to check myself by checking out the book. I know it mentioned aquamarine shale, and it does, but it doesn't say anything about the lava. It says it's the shale is shaped by the continuous flow of water and starlight. It says nothing about lava and starlight. So I don't really know what's up with this, but it works. <laughs> Occasionally get aquamarine shale. Um, so yeah, I've got three running all at the same time. And I've just got a a bunch of auto breakers connected to it. I think just two. One in the front, one in the back. Yeah, you could place more. You could put one, I guess, probably above it and below it to make it even faster. Because it generates the sand almost instantly. You see, the sand never really disappears. It's incredibly fast. So the more breakers you have, basically the faster the output. So auto breakers, they just break the sand. They send it over to this open crate. Which then drops it here, and then what I have going on here, this is not Astral Sorcery, this is actually Batania. So there's a thing in Batania called the Luminizer. The Luminizers, I guess. These are Luminizers, the individual points, and this is a Luminizer launcher right here, which is activated with a redstone signal from that hovering hourglass that goes every second. Um, so basically, a luminizer is just a transport system for entities or for items. I could actually go on the thing, uh, you could send a pig on it, really whatever you want. And they're limited to, I don't know, something like 16 blocks, they have to be within 60 blocks of each other, you link them up, and then if you put something into the luminizer, I think, I think you can go into the luminizer yourself by just clicking on it, yeah. Whee, we get to ride the super, <laughs> the super nice rainbow train, it's really beautiful. Let me get out of that. So if you want to just travel it yourself, you can just right-click it, but if you want to use it for automation, which is what I've done, then you need the Luminizer Launcher. Luminizer Launcher, when provided with a redstone signal, will just launch whatever's on the pad into the nearest Luminizer, which is what it's doing. So every time it activates, it sends the sand off, and occasionally the Aquamarines whenever we get them. Yeah, just use it as a really... I, I wanted, like, an aesthetically fitting way of getting these magical items back to the base. And Astral Sorcery, as far as I know, doesn't really have any item transport systems, so just turn to Batania, and I think it turns out really well. Yeah, you can see it just going right there. It goes right, basically, to the center of the inventory place, and then just gets picked up by this range collector, which is filtered only pick up aquamarine and sand, and then sends it off into the system. So it's both very, very nice for getting aquamarines. I mean, it used to be I'd have to travel around to the uh, little temples that you find all over the place and get a couple for each temple, but now I've got 2.6 thousand aquamarines, which is more than I could ever possibly need. It's ridiculous. But another nice benefit of it, too, is now I have basically unlimited sand. It's really nice, because before if I wanted a bunch of sand, I'd have to throw either a bunch of gravel into a crusher or a bunch of cobblestone into a crusher, which then turns into gravel, and then you throw that into the crusher, and there was no super fast way of making sand. It was, it was all kind of a process, but this, just, I have as much sand as I could ever possibly want. So that solved my aquamarine problem. Now the point of getting a bunch of aquamarine is twofold. One thing is just they're used often in recipes, but another thing is they're used to get liquid starlight, which I needed a bunch of. This thing over here, the Starlight Infuser requires 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 buckets of liquid starlight around it. And when you craft something inside of the Starlight Infuser, there's a small chance that it'll actually use up a bucket. So it requires uh, 12 just to build the thing, and then occasionally a little bit more to maintain it. So, I made this system over here to actually take the Aquamarines and turn them into liquid starlight. Very simple system. Actually, it's not that simple. It's a little bit tricky. And it's a little bit funky, but it seems to basically work. Uh, I've just got an x neck controller here. I've got a chest here. Basically, you throw aquamarines in here, and it should place them in each one of these. A little bit slowly, but... There we go. Come on. There we go. <laughs> Alright, so now each one is collecting liquid starlight. Each one of these light wells. So light wells don't like to be automated. I don't know if they're even really supposed to be automated. Um, so I can't just, like, pipe things in or out of them. I couldn't just connect an XNet connector to this and just place it directly in there. Instead, 
I have, can you see from down here? No, I covered it up, but I, you see this little black bit here beneath the light? Well, I have mechanical users beneath each one, so what it's actually doing is piping the aquamarines into each mechanical user, which is then activating it and using the aquamarine on each light well. But then I have a little bit of a problem of, like, I wanted to store a buffer of, of um, liquid starlight. I didn't want to just be stuck with the two buckets in each one, so I made this advanced fluid tank with, from Mechanism, storing 28 buckets, which is great, but then I had the problem of how do I fill this with the liquid, because again, I can't just pump liquid directly out of the light well. It doesn't like that. So, instead, um, I basically do a bunch of trickery with buckets. I put a bunch of buckets in each one of these mechanical users, which sucks out the stuff, and then it throws it in here, the full liquid starlight buckets, and then this mechanical user uses it on this fluid tank, and then sends the empty buckets back. That's basically how it works. It's a little bit funky, which you would see if it wasn't for the fact that this thing is full, but since it's full, you don't really notice how funky it is. It's just sometimes it, sometimes it will use up these liquid starlight buckets, and then it'll use the empty buckets on the advanced fluid tank, which then fills up the bucket, and it'll just get stuck in kind of a loop of like, fill, empty, fill, empty, fill, empty, fill, empty, and these the empty buckets don't get extracted fast enough, and I'm not really sure why that happens, but it seems to basically work. It's a lot faster than doing it myself. Ah, oh, yeah, so I already kind of showed this, the starlight infuser. Pretty straightforward. Again, you just throw something in it, anything that can be infused, like... So you throw stuff like the aquamarines inside of the thing to turn them into resonating gems. Is there any other resonating thing? I swear there's something else I've thrown in here. I also get the slightest feeling that I've maybe already showed the starlight infuser. I don't remember. Anyway, fairly simple. The hardest part, honestly, with this thing is just building the multi-block structure. A lot of these multi-block structures are kind of difficult. Because you can see they have a lot of blocks that don't connect to each other. A lot of these, like, diagonal pieces, which need support structures to build off of. And I don't know, I just end up messing them up all the time. And all the marble kind of looks the same. But it needs to be the exact right sort of marble in the exact right spot. And for the final piece of Astral Sorcery, we have... The Attunement Altar. It's actually becoming... Nighttime. Um, let me show you this thing actually running, because right now it's not really running. Alright, so how the Atuman Altar works is, and try to ignore the kind of annoying sound, it's stuck making noise once again. Um, it allows you to attune things like rock crystals, or your, even yourself. It allows you to attune it to a constellation that's in the sky. So right now you can see there's these two. I don't remember what that one's called, but this one over here is Armara, if we look at the paper. That's Armara. So Armara has a certain effect. I don't... Uh, I think it says in here, right? Constellations, Armara. Yes, so defense. A repulsion force pushing away from the light of this constellation, much like a shield or protective barrier. So it's some sort of like a pushing protective barrier sort of constellation. That's the effect it has. And you can imbue that effect in anything that you attune to that specific constellation. Now, in my case, I'm just going to enter the menu so the sound stops. In my case, I just needed to make attuned stuff for a crafting recipe. It didn't need to be attuned to any one specific constellation. So specific constellation was irrelevant for my purposes. But if I wanted to do stuff, if I wanted to make a certain effect appear in a certain item, then I'd be more choosy with exactly which constellation I did. So, if I wanted that specific constellation, or I just wanted an attuned something, what you do is you hold the constellation paper in your hand, and you see these little... these little things appear. So, um, you can actually put this in your offhand. So if you put down these spectral relays at those points, Check that out. You get a really cool looking effect. Lights up all nice looking, this thing starts to move. 
and at that point you can throw an object onto there to attune it, or even throw yourself onto it. Although I think I'm already attuned to something, it might not... Yeah, I think you can only have one attunement or something like that. So it won't attune me. But if I didn't have an attunement, then I could throw myself on there and it would attune me to the repulsing force, whatever that would do. Yeah, it's really cool. I love how that works. Astro Sorcery is a really beautiful mod. Oh yeah, and the very, very last thing to show of stuff that changed in the in the large break is there's a bunch of animal stuff that none needed. So the cats are still doing great. And you might notice there's an extra little friend in here. Hey, Al. Hey there. <laughs> They're so cute. Yeah, so that's just temporary, of course. I need to make them an actual proper owl place and get some more owls. But for now, they're hanging out in there. We've got a chicken farm. With some dark wood fence. They enjoy the water. Do they enjoy it, actually? Or are they all just trying to desperately escape, but they can't fight against the force of the flowing water? Anyway, and we also have a donkey and some horses, some of which spots, and I'm just a horse, some of which have skin, like them, and others don't. We got Bony Pony and Spooky. We were really surprised to find these in Minecraft. It turns out they're actually not added by a mod. They're actually just a default Minecraft mob. I forgot exactly how they spawn in, but I think for us they like appeared after a like after a thunderstorm, I think. A bunch of skeletons and these bony ponies just appeared on the water or something. I don't know, it was really strange. It was like a very specific sort of thing that has to happen for them to appear. But then we just grabbed them with a bunch of golden lassos and stuff and took them here. We did have some horrible experiences though, because it turns out that... Um, what was it? Was it light? Or water? Something damages them. There's something that damages them. I can't imagine it's light because we have all these light orbs around here. But yeah, so some of them died before we figured it out, whatever it was. I think there was a uh, memorial here. Yeah, Unni did this. Rip. Bony pony. Okay, so it's time to mess around with RF tools controls. I'm not going to get into the power system that I plan on doing, because we're not really going to touch on that in this episode. I just want to get more familiar with RF Tools controls. Or sorry, RF Tools control. Singular, not plural. So I've got a million things made from it. I don't really know how almost any of this works. I made one RF Tools control thing like a year ago to do something extremely simple that didn't require most of this stuff. But I want to learn how to use it more properly. All right, so we have a programmer. This is the thing that we use to actually like, make the logic. This is the thing we use the programmer to make the program and then we put it onto the program card, which then gets inserted inside of the CPU. There's also a node, which I think is used for like remote access as kind of like a an extra arm of the CPU for it to interact with other things, I think. Because otherwise I think the CPU would only be able to interact with things directly around it. And I think the node is just kind of like an extra extension to activate other things further away from it. We have a workbench. I have no idea what this is for. It says, works well with a processor, but can also be used standalone. I don't know what works well with a processor means, but I'll try it. And then this is the processor itself. And the rest of this is all sorts of stuff like network cards and RAM chips and the CPU itself and modules and a graphics card and a network identifier. I don't know. <laughs> Let's just get started. For ease of use, I'm just going to put down some uh, wireless power transmitters so I don't have to hook everything up. Probably going to be moving it around all the time. So... Yeah, so this is the programmer. Here's all the like visual programming things. Um, I'm not going to mess with that just yet. Let's put a node down as well. Set the name of the network channel to connect to. And the name of this specific node. So channel and node. Okay. 
So yeah, you can, so you have to put a network card inside of the CPU to basically scan an area around it. Um, it even says, with this advanced network card, it says range 33 by 33 by 33. So this in the CPU will scan around that 33 range and look for nodes that it can connect to. Does it say anything else? A processor has only six sides, but using a network, you can extend this by also enabling access to the sides of all nodes that are connected to the network. So yes. So if you want to just control other stuff like turn redstone on and off in an area other than directly where the CPU is, then that's what nodes are for. Cool. I never used nodes, by the way, when I used it before. Um, let's see. Let's, let's see what this workbench is. Okay, I mean, that just seems like a workbench with its own inventory. It's a normal crafting device with an internal buffer for items. It can be used just like that. However, its main use is an automation as this workbench supports piping out the crafted results from the bottom. In addition, a program running on a processor can directly input ingredients for a recipe in the workbench from the top side. Hmm. Internal buffer of the workbench is often used for crafting cards to help with auto-crafting setups. Okay, so I probably don't need it then, because I don't think I'm going to be doing any crafting. Hmm. So, is it... Uh, let me test something. Oh, I see. Okay, for a second I was thinking maybe this was sort of like the RF Tools crafter, which I haven't shown you, but the way it works is like you put in a ghost of items. It doesn't actually use the item itself. You tell it a recipe like this, and then you put in all the things to supply it with down here. I was thinking maybe that was how it would work, but no. Hmm. Yeah, I don't think I'll be needing that. Oh, I should probably have the pickaxe on my bar. Okay, and we have the processor itself. Why is it not getting any... There we go, now it's getting power. I guess the... Maybe the wireless RF transmitters don't scan instantly. They probably scan like every second or something for new things to connect to. So this is where you'd put all these modules, I suppose. So, I guess just let's throw some in. So CPU core. Where does that go? Where does it go? <laughs> Set up item and variable allocation for this card. This is a lot of empty spaces and I'm a bit overwhelmed. I mean, these are definitely where cards go, like network cards and probably graphics cards, which is for drawing vector graphics. Don't know if I'll ever need that. Variable module. Um, I've got these RAM chips allows extra variables. Oh. Oh, so apparently you have no variables unless you put in a RAM chip. That makes sense. No RAM, no variables. So that gives you eight. This gives you another eight. What is this? Variable is not defined. So that's probably what these variable modules are for. I don't know how to define them, though. This is going to be quite complex. But yeah, those go there. I'm sure the graphics card goes there. Um, I think I just throw this in, right? Yeah, that'd probably just be thrown in. Okay, read a little bit more of the manual. I'm kind of just flying by the seat of my pants here. Uh, it looks like the CPU just goes down here with all the other cards. So, I've got it there. Um, this thing is... I believe this is to allocate the resources for the program card. So for this specific program card, which I don't have anything actually programmed on there, but if I want that program to be able to access variables, then I do this allocation and I say that, let's say like this is variable one that I'm giving to this program card to, to use, two, three, four, so on. And then these are just item slots. I guess this is just like an item buffer that you can use for item stuff. So that's what that is. Let's try to get a program going. 
Let's just see if we can make anything work. So I think that goes there. Let's just add in something really simple. Like, let's just try to make it output redstone. Okay, I've got a very simple program here. Let's see if this works. So before I show you the actual program, what I'm intending to test is just try to read some redstone and write some redstone. So I've got the processor here. And if we look at the minimap, this is the west direction. So on the west side, I have my own control over redstone using the lever. This is where I'm going to read redstone from. And here I've got some redstone just for writing to, just so I can visually see that the redstone is or isn't being output on, on the east side. So remember, west is where we're reading from. So it looks like all programs start with an event, these like yellowish background ones. The event I'm going with is just repeat, which will just repeat this program every however many ticks you set here. So I've got a set for 20 ticks. So every second, this program will repeat. Next, we read redstone on the west side. And when you click on this, by the way, to change it, you can set a constant. And this is kind of just to manually enter it. On the, the constant is just you manually entering whatever value you want. I have it set to the west side. You can also specify a node to read from. So we'll get into that with networking. You can also do a variable. And can also do a function. Whoops. So we're reading from the west side, the side that has the lever. Next, after reading that, I have a test greater than. So for the first value, the side on the left of this greater than symbol, the bigger side that we're testing, is set to function last int, the last opcode result converted to an integer. So basically, it's taking whatever the redstone was that it read here and putting it in on the left side of this test. For the other value, we're testing against zero. So if the redstone is greater than zero, in other words, if there's a redstone signal and it's on, then it does the green thing. You see this little connection is green. Then it will set the redstone on the east side to on. So if I've turned the redstone on, it should set this redstone on. And then I believe this little red connection means that this is what happens if the test fails, which has an outputting redstone of zero. So read the redstone. If the redstone is greater than zero, then output full redstone signal on the east side. If it's not greater than zero, output zero. Should work. So this will save the program to the card. Get a name for the card. Redstone test, sure. Let's toss that in and see if it works. Debug display? Idle. I saw it change for a sec. Then Q waiting items locked. So I have it set on debug just to show me stuff. Yeah, I'll just leave it on debug. I don't know if I need to like turn it on. Because you can enter, this is like a console here that you can enter in commands. I don't know. Start. Clear, stop, reset, list. Okay, well, I guess it's probably just running then. So let's turn this on and see if it works. Oh. Look at that. Haha, <laughs> it works. Um, let me move this a little bit over so I can see the other redstone a bit more. Or, you know what? Let's just do that. There. Easier to see. So remember, it's repeating the event every 20 ticks, so every second. So minimum delay, it could be almost instant, but maximum delay, it could be up to a second before it responds. Reads it. Turns it on. Reads it. Turns it off. Haha! <laughs> I'm a master programmer. Alright, that's all I'm going to need to be able to build this whole new system with this processor. Great, we're done. No, okay, I guess we got a bit more work to do. Let's try to do the same setup here, but let's use a node to either output or input. Let's use it for input. Let's use this node. Let's say we want to get the redstone signal from this node. How the heck would I do that? So I need to set a channel. And then the node has its own name. 
Um, I'll just say channel one. Name node one. That sh should be fine. So this thing does have a network card. Um, I know you need to like do this net setup thing to have it like scan around for other networks to connect to. So I need to type that into here. Um, but also, of course, we need to integrate it into our program. So let's take this program out. Throw it in here. You could load the current program from a program card if you wanted to. It's already here, of course. But you could also like clear this, load it back from the card. Um, yeah, so let's change our read redstone. So instead of reading it from the west of the processor, we want to read it from the east of node 1. So let's change this. East of node 1. Okay. That shouldn't be everything. I still need to set up the network. Yeah, missing node, missing node, missing node. Okay. I guess I'll take that out for a sec. So it stops spamming me. Help. So net setup. Set up a channel first. How do I set up a channel? Net list. No nodes. Net info. Um. Use net setup name in processor console to set up the network. Oh. Oh, oh, oh. That's weird. It doesn't say that. Is there like a... Can I do like help, help net setup and will it like tell me anything about that specifically? Actually, if I do net setup help, I think it'll set the network as the name help. So net setup one, right? Found one node. Found zero crafting stations. Okay. Net setup list should list it. Wait, what? It just said found one nodes. And then... Wait. Did I mess something up? Net list. No nodes? Net setup. One. Found one node. Net list. There we go. I think I like unset it or something. Found node one. Okay, so I think we should be good now. Can I do like a... Can I do a clear? Yeah. It's not complaining about a missing node. Let's see if this works. Haha! <laughs> That's so cool! Okay, so now I absolutely know how nodes work. So that's how you, yeah, that's the, the arms of your processor. Like, unless you want to stuff your processor right next to the every single thing that you want to be able to control, you're going to want to use nodes. Wow. That's so cool. I'm sorry, this is just really cool. Um, What should I do next? Variables would be a good thing, right? I don't, am I going to have to use variables? I have no idea. I really don't. I'm not sure how my setup's going to work with this thing, because I don't even really know how to use it. I also made this thing called a network identifier. Sneak right click on a processor to set the target for this identifier. I don't know what this is actually used for, because I didn't need it for the network card or the node. Network identifiers set the block. Yeah, I have no idea what that's used for. I know there's inter-process communications. You can have multiple processors communicate with each other. Maybe it's somehow related to that. Hey, we've been blessed by the monarch. Let me think of what to test next. Okay, I'm going to test kind of three separate things here. Number one is I'm going to break my program into... I don't really know what these are. I mean, everything that's running on one program card is one process. Because it's running on one processor, I think, but these aren't connected. They're both initiated with just a repeat every 20 ticks every second. 
So like, which one's going to go first? Does it go like top down, maybe left to right, top down, like reading in terms of the order of operations? And I, I'm not quite sure, but I guess they're going to be done at roughly the same time. I'm assuming it doesn't give me any errors. So that's one thing I'm testing just to see if having these two separate things actually works. Um, the other thing I'm testing is setting and reading variables. So we're doing the same thing before where we read from the read the redstone from this side of the node. Uh, but instead of using that value directly, we are storing it inside a variable zero, index zero. So we're storing it in that variable, and then on this other line, which is also repeating every second, I'm um, evaluating string, so I'm getting a string from variable zero. So this, this is going to set the variable to whatever the redstone input is, which is going to be 15, since the lever is just right outside the node, right next to it. This should evaluate that 15 as a string, and then it's going to output it to log message. Actually, wait a sec. This is outputting variable zero to log message. I don't think I need this eval as string, do I? I think I can just put that here. Yeah, because I could set it to function last string on that eval string, but I don't even need to eval string, I think. It'll probably just automatically convert it to a string. If it even needs to, to output it to the console, I don't know. Th that'll probably work. Just outputting the variable zero. So we're going to try writing to a variable and reading from a variable and outputting it to the console. All right, let's test it. Yeah, missing a variable. So um, let's allocate you a variable. There we go. Oh, and it's doing it. Yeah, it's just spamming the console. <laughs> Which is exactly what I told it to do, isn't it? Okay. Fifteen seconds ago. Let's change this from debug display to normal log. There we go. Okay. So if we flip this. Hmm. That's a problem. Is it still outputting? It is, it's still spitting out zeros. Why? Uh, hold on, maybe the lever can't be directly there. Maybe I need to have redstone there? Hmm. Hmm. I wonder if it's just not running this top line. Maybe it's not setting or reading the redstone at all because they're separate. Let me just try moving this here. So then right after setting the variable, it's just going to output it. Yeah, let's try that. Still outputting zeros. Hmm. Huh. Well, it turns out I was misunderstanding something, but fixing that misunderstanding still didn't make it work. And it's not behaving as I would expect it to. Not just because of that problem, but also because of something else. Um, so the misunderstanding I was having is that I was thinking that this set variable I was thinking I need to set variable to variable zero. Not really what you're supposed to do. That's basically saying uh, the value enter here is what variable you want to set. And by setting the variable I want to set to variable zero, I'm reading the value of variable zero and saying that that value of variable zero is the variable I want to store it at, which I th I'm assuming everything is initialized to zero, so it probably would have the same end result. But yeah, it should be a constant, really, because the variable I want to set isn't something I want to actually vary. I always want to set variable zero. So I've got that, and then just logging out variable zero. I'm just curious, if I just set this to the last string, would that work? Let me just test that real quick. No. Didn't think so. Because I don't think I've even evaluated a string. 
so yeah, here's the unexpected behavior. Well, one is that it still doesn't work, even though it seems relatively straightforward, and I certainly feel like it should. Reading variable zero, variable zero, save. Yeah, so this sets variable zero, and then this reads variable zero. But it's all, I mean, it is, sort of, but it's always outputting zero. I thought maybe it was a problem with the node, so I just simplified it, and instead I'm reading from the processor directly, so I'm reading from the east side, which is where this is. Um, yep, evaluating from the east side. Here's the weird unexpected behavior. Notice how it's spamming the log, even though it's set to run only every 80 ticks, which should be every 4 seconds. So this operation log message should only happen every 4 seconds. And yet... Where's my program? Did I not take it out? Oh, somehow it ended up on the ground. So if I put that in here... Wait a sec. Wait, what? Does it work now? It doesn't? Huh. Is it still outputting 15? It is. But, yeah, so I don't know why that worked, but you can see that it's spamming 15 extremely fast. Right, you can see this is the scroll bar. After I cleared it, just like, it's like doing it once a tick, like 20 times a second. But it should only be going every four seconds. So why is it spamming the output? And if I turn that on, it's not going to work, right? Okay, so it looks like whatever the value is when the program starts running is what it stays as. Why? I don't understand. So now that it's on, if I put that back in, it seems to wait the four seconds sort of before it starts running. You see there's a bit of a wait and then, then it starts spamming. All right, take it out, put it in. It should be zeros. It's still not really waiting four seconds even. Hmm. So the very it's it's like it's setting the variable, but it's not setting it multiple times. I don't understand. It's just set to set variable. Set variable zero with whatever the previous result is, the read redstone. This is very strange. Okay, um, somehow I got it to work. And frankly, I don't even know what I did. I didn't really change much. I just broke it back down to how it was before, where it's two separate things. They can be two separate lines unconnected. You, that works just fine. Um, this is the same, it just reads from the east side of the processor, it sets variable zero. This repeats every 20 ticks, and it prints out variable zero. And now it works, I'm pretty sure I did that literal exact same thing before. And now it not only actually does change the variable and, and actually reflects that in the console output log, but it also doesn't spam the console like once every single tick. I must have been bugged or something. Because I changed nothing. The only thing I did is I set this to go every one tick, and then I put a wait. Um, here we go. I put operation wait right after it. And I told it to like wait for 20 ticks. I did that, and then it seemed to start working. And I thought, why would I need to wait though? And then I ended up deleting it. And found that it still worked even after deleting it. So, that's the program that's in it right now. If we clear it, you can see it's outputting like every second at a reasonable rate. Zero, zero, zero. Turn that on. Now it works. So, yeah, I think it was just bugged before or something. This is the newest version of RF Tools Control, by the way. I checked just to make sure. Doesn't mean it can't be bugged, but it's the least buggy version I could possibly have. Okay, well, I'm just going to chalk that up to just bad luck hitting a bug. Hopefully it won't happen again. Because that was making me have to do some weird mental contortions to try to figure out what I was doing wrong. Turns out, I guess nothing. Okay. Well, with that, we know how to read and write to nodes. We know how the network art works. I know that I can have multiple processes going at the same time. I know how to write to the console log on the screen. I know how to set and read variables. I say we've learned a lot. There's still a lot more to go, but it's getting kind of late, so I think I'm going to end this episode here and pick up with some more R&D in the next one. So I hope you've enjoyed so far, and I'll be back soon.